This is the Crossing Bridges podcast, addressing the topics of leadership, criminal justice, and fatherhood. How can we become better leaders? Where are all the daddies? Why is crime at an all-time high? Here is your host, Bayonle Arashi. All right, it's another episode of Crossing Bridges podcast uh, with Bayonle Arashi. I'm very excited today. And if you guys have been listening to the last four episodes, this is the fifth episode. And I made that, that good news uh, last time that from now on, we'll be able to bring guests on the show, uh, thought leaders, uh, leaders in their own capacity that are doing some amazing work. And I'm very, very excited today to have one of them uh, on the show. And we're going to be discussing leadership, uh, criminal justice and fatherhood. Um, I'm here uh, to discuss today with uh, Coach Dustin Wise. Uh, he is the head soccer coach for men's and women at the Allegheny College in Maryland. Uh, I met this man sometime last year and he was really, really very warm. Uh, so Coach, without much ado, welcome to Crossing Bridges Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. All right, Coach, uh, before any questions at all, can you tell me... Uh, Introduce yourself to the uh, viewers and the listeners of uh, the Crossing Bridges podcast. Yeah, of course. So, like you said, my name is Dustin Wise. I'm the head soccer coach at Allegheny College of Maryland. We're a Division II junior college. I've been there now since 2021. I basically started the men's program from scratch. COVID kind of wiped everything out and kind of restarted that program. And currently, we're in the process of starting a women's program for the first time since 2007, and they're set to take the field here in the fall of 2023. So very excited for that to happen. And we have a good group of guys coming back for the men's side and have some great recruits coming in. So I'm ready. I'm ready for the fall to get here. We actually do start our spring season tomorrow for the men's side. So slowly getting back to my normal, so to speak. That's that's very good. And I remember uh, early in the year uh, we met uh, – at the soccer convention in uh, Philadelphia, uh, where uh, top guy, where, who is who in the soccer industry uh, normally attend every year in the United States. And it was a very, very uh, interesting uh, discussion with you about what your plan is going forward. Uh, Coach, can you tell me how it has been with you uh, dealing with uh, young people that you work with at the college? How, how easy or how challenging has it been for you? Yeah, so every every individual brings their own set of life experiences to the table, which means every individual is a lot different than the last individual. We have some students who come in, uh, they make my life very easy. We have some that come in, not so much, right? So it's our job in our role, especially being a junior college, we have to bring in the players that we're looking to hopefully have for two years, but knowing that we might only have these guys for one season, um, it could just be the fall semester, get them into college and kind of give them some exposure. For others, we'll have them for the full two years, whatever. Um, of the guys that we had last season, I've had a couple that have already found their forever home, so to speak. They've transferred on to Division two programs, have a couple guys talking to some Division three programs looking to transfer um, and then guys that we have in hopes of returning, uh, just trying to get everything set up and make sure that they're ready to go here once we're, we hit, you know, spring season, like I said, starting tomorrow and then summer break and then have everything ready in place for fall. We start August 1st. I'm hoping that this year with our move up from division three to division two, I'm hoping this year is a year where we actually do challenge, you know, some of those top dogs in the, in the country. Our, our conference is not easy. Maryland is is very, very talented, very, very difficult to navigate through. So um, that's that's a good thing, though, more than anything. You know, having the opportunity to face these top opponents and learning from them, it only makes us better. So that's a that's a very good uh, uh, angle to look at it you have to you have to be uh, a competitor to have that kind of mindset and I'm very very happy that we started uh, based uh, talking about your, your your job and uh, your role at the co- at, at, at the college at the moment and what your plan is uh, for the year but for this podcast majorly what it stands for 
is for us to take a deeper look at the the concept of uh, a leader um what's wh why we have so much issue uh, around uh, criminal justice system in the United States and in the world at the moment and fatherhood. So I am going to go deeper now and then I'm sure we're going to come back to your profession later. But my, my next question for you will be what informed your decision uh, to become a soccer coach? Uh, has, has it always been something that you want to do? Um, how did you find your way, your path uh, towards this current position that you are in now as a leader? Yeah, I've always been kind of ambitious in a regard of um, I've always wanted more. I'm never satisfied. And I feel like sport kind of always makes you have to. You can never be satisfied with sport. I guess I'll put it that way. Um, because as soon as you get comfortable being a good team, a good coach, a good player, you're going to run against somebody that's better. And now what? You know, so now you got to kind of learn and get back. You know, you win a championship. What's the next step? win another championship, right? Like you don't just stop because you're at the top. Like you got to continue to fight. Look at Tom Brady, for example. He's just now, he had announced again, he's retiring for the second time, right? But a lot of people are like, well, why didn't he go out after he won that championship with Tampa Bay two years ago? And now, you know, you have that competitive edge. You want to come back. You want to, you want more. That's always been my mindset as a, as an individual. I always want more, you know? So yeah, I'm a I'm a soccer coach, but I'm also a husband. I'm a father. I've got two children. Um, currently starting a business. Like everything is, I'm I'm pushing myself to get more out of my life because I want more. I want more. That I want something that I can then pass on to my children, pass on to, you know, my generation behind me, and just continue to to help everyone around me. Right, and I think that's where coaching. And this also has to deal with, we, we chatted about this a little bit um, before talking about the podcast, but when you bring in like ego, I have a really big ego in the fact that I want to help everyone around me, right? Like that's, that's my niche. Like I really want everyone around me to get better. So everything I do, I'm looking at how can I make those around me better? That's where coaching it's everything. I get to, I get to help players become better soccer players. I get to help players become better students, help them become better men, soon to be help them become better women and tie it all together to hopefully become the best version of you. So that's kind of where coaching has kind of led me throughout the years. That's 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 a very fantastic uh, point and thank you very much for that answer. Uh, I will say this uh, going forward that I've always been a believer of uh feeling that two things shaped us uh, in life. Uh, number one is our experience. Our experience shaped us to be who we are. And of course, our environment, the environment, the community that we grow up with uh, shaped us as well. So for you uh, growing up, uh, what would you say uh, shaped you to become uh, who you are today? What role would you say your experience uh, growing up with your parents, and did you grow up with both of your parents? And what role did your mom and your father play in, in shaping you to who you are today? Yeah, so I, I grew up both parent family. Um, I attended a private Christian school, K through 12. Um, my father, before I was of kindergarten age, so I was maybe three, four years old, my father left the business he was working for to attempt to start his own business. Uh, this almost led to our family becoming bankrupt. Thankfully, the former employer that he had worked for took him back. Uh, so he went back, worked for him for a couple more years. Then he ventured off again around my kindergarten, first grade year, and started another business with a partner. Um, together, they built a trailer manufacturing company that in 1996 and 1997 was nominated or was awarded, I guess, would be the actual wording of this, uh, top 100 fastest growing company in America. So seeing that, you know, my dad retired in 2001. My dad was at the time, let me do some quick math, uh, 35, I think, roughly. So my dad retired at 35. Um, that didn't last long. He got bored and went back to work very quickly after. But um, so I've always kind of seen that as like, that's where I need to be, right? Like I got to, 
got to push myself to where at 35, I should be successful, right? What I've learned over these years is your definition of success, my definition of success is very different, right? It's very different. So where my definition of success was five years ago, 10 years ago, that's a lot different today too. Now that I have a wife, I have kids, like I said, we just built a house, we have two dogs, like that's a success story to a lot of people. Me, I still, I'm, I want more. I want more. Like now I'm like, okay, now let me dabble in business. Let me get a business up and running. Let me start a semi-professional soccer club like I'm trying to do. Let's try to do all these little things now and, and push the envelope, push it even further. Right? So I got that. That all came from my dad. The go-getter mentality, willing to work, willing to try to become more and get more out of life. From my mother, she was a stay-at-home mother. So I got a lot of the nurturing side from her, which I think the two combined is what has helped me become or want to become a better coach because the nurturing side helps me realize that, yes, there are people who need help. You know, I bring in players from all over the world. They don't have the same experiences that I've had. How can I help their life be better? So like I touched on earlier, that could be academically, that could be athletically, whatever, but let me help you become the best version of yourself. And I think I get that a lot from my from my mother. That's 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 a very, very interesting answer. Thank you very much for, for sharing that uh, deeper part of your life with you. And my next question will, will still has to go around that line. You working with uh, kids from different backgrounds um, that are shaped also by their experiences and by their environment. How have you been able to manage uh, most of these kids and what has been your most, um, I don't want to use the word annoying experience, but what has been your most challenging experience? What uh, demography of kids have you had the most issues with? Because for us on this podcast, the, the, the problem, the puzzle we are trying to solve is how can we help some of these young adults and teenagers to become better themselves. And of course, for the, for most of them, they always use their uh, environment as an excuse, which is okay for you to use as an excuse or saying, I grew up with one parent. We know the odds of that today, especially in the United States, is very, very high. But for you as a coach that works with kids from different backgrounds and different homes, how have you been able to manage and what is one or two experience that you want to share uh, of how you have encountered uh, a, a, diff a very special kid and how you've been able to surmount in helping him or her? Yeah, so like you said, the product of my environment, I mean, that gets tossed around a lot. Um, we've even said it as coaches to one another, me and my staff, whenever we have a kid who might be acting out, I was like, well, what did they come from? You know, a lot of my kids were junior college, so we're not as expensive as four years, which mean a lot of my kids are those that come potentially from a lower income family. And a lot of that is single family households. Um, we've had everything, though. You know, like you said, we've we've had both parents in the house, students come through the, the program. We've had single family, uh, single parent families, whether it was I was raised by mom, I was raised by dad, I was raised by grandma, grandpa, whatever. Like I've, I've seen it all. Um, I don't really think that one individual like upbringing has necessarily shaped the problem child, so to speak, or has shaped the best member of the team, so to speak. I think it's all what's kind of inside of them. Right. So, for example, I've had a player this past fall who was a single single family, single parent family, um, came in and he was a leader. He was motivated. He wanted to lead the team. He is now not with the program. He's gone on to a larger school. I've had individuals come in this past year, single parent family. They come in. They struggle right off the bat. But a lot of the people, surprisingly, Maybe surprisingly, maybe not surprisingly, but the kids I bring from out of the out of Allegheny County, which is the majority of my kids, those that are single parent family kids, they do not last. And it's not because of behaviors. A lot of it is because they get here. Now they're hours away from mom. In some cases, they're multiple hours away from mom. And 
mom's not doing well because of this adjustment. They were, in some cases, the breadwinner for mom. Now they don't have that, and they see like this added stress on their their parent, and then that makes them want to go back home. Um, I've actually had that conversation multiple times with multiple different players here in the last couple of weeks. Um, how, how do we help mom out? Do I have scholarships available? Unfortunately, I don't. You know, like little things like how how do we make this better for you? But that's one thing I think would be the best example is that a lot of these kids that come in that were raised in a single parent home, they come and play for me. And then you kind of see them pick up that nurturing side that I mentioned earlier, where now they see all the issues that mom or dad might be facing back home and they want to go home and help. Um, And it's quick. And I'm not sure, maybe I'm doing too good on that regard because then I lose them after one season instead of having them for the two. But I think in the, the long run, you know, we're trying to make these players better individuals and we're trying to help them long-term. So I'm all for it. I'll help anybody if they want to go home. Thank you very much for, for sharing that. And I, I am sure the, you know the reason, you probably know the reason why I, I asked this question. I want to make sure that I am not the only one that see or that believe these problems do exist. Um, and one of the reasons why I decided to start a podcast uh, such as this um, with the title Crossing Bridges and talking about uh, leadership, uh, talking about fatherhood, talking about criminal justice, uh, where was because where I come from, like, like you said, my experience shaped who I am. My environment shaped who I am. I was not born in the United States. I was born in Nigeria. I was born in West Africa. And I've, I've, I was very privileged to have traveled to some countries uh, before I decided to relocate here. And even me relocating to the United States was not something that I said, okay, I want to do. That comes from me just desiring it. It was a push for me to say, okay, just like you said at the beginning of the conversation that you've always wanted more. For me, I looked at my children then. I'm like, like I said in, my, in the last episode, the, the oldest of them being 10 year old and the, and the youngest being one year old. And I look and I ask myself the question, what kind of life do I want to give these girls? how I want them to have a better life than I have. So I had to make that decision to be able to, uh, and that sacrifice, and then find my way down here. And of course, before I came here, I had a different mindset as well, that once you come to the United States, everything is easy. You're going to, you can make money every day, but I'm, I'm sure you know the reality of that right now. And we've had this conversation in the past, but going forward in our, in, in our conversation, how do you think uh, most of these kids that are from single parent home, which is so, uh, the, the percentage of it is so high in the United States, how do you think we can begin to make them realize that it is not enough excuse to say, because I am from a single parent home, my, I, I only grew up with my mom, my dad was not in my life, to start making them to realize that your life actually belongs to you and for them to be able to push themselves and become somebody in life what are the, what are the major things that you think you you want to share as an as experience as experienced as you are now and as a father and as a husband as well that will make them better and i'll give you I'll now then ask you my uh, three uh questions that i normally ask every of my every of my guests on the show Yeah, I think, well, for our situation in particular, the fact that we have on-campus housing as a junior college definitely helps with that because we have these kids moving in and now they're they're in a situation where, yeah, they might be living in an apartment with other, you know, members of the soccer team, but mommy, daddy, they're not home. They're not here to help you now. Like, you want to eat? Figure out how to eat. Our cafeteria closes at 4 p.m., so we have practice at 4 p.m., Right. So we're training from four to seven at times. When you're done, you want to go home. You're going to get something to eat. Are you going to make it or are you just going to hope that it magically appears? You've got to figure out how to make it right. Like you got to figure out how to get everything that you want out of life. Um, having examples now with our players of guys who have been 
successful coming from, you know, bad situations, having guys who have struggled coming from bad situations. I think that helps whenever you have someone who's kind of on the edge, right? Like we have a member of the team who might be on the edge who they understand where they can get better, but they don't necessarily know how to. Don't be afraid to ask questions, right? We are all here to help you become better. I think that's the biggest thing whenever you have individuals coming from rough situations in a sense they kind of want to fall back on instinct um, and that might be you know if you're raised in a tough environment that might mean you're questioned you want to fight okay well what's fighting gonna what's that gonna fall like what's that gonna solve for you in the long run um, we have guys who have come in and you know they're from a situation, like I mentioned, where now mom's not doing well. They, they feel bad. Well, why do you feel bad? Like, what what's causing the grief for mom? Is it that you feel like you have to be, you know, the breadwinner and you take care of her? That's great. That's showing that you're taking responsibility for others. Um, and I think that's a step in the right direction. But everybody kind of grows along at a different pace. Um, and everyone kind of grows in different ways. So you just kind of have to push, constantly push, uh, try to get the most out of everybody. And, yeah. That's, that's, that's very interesting. Thank you very much for answering that. As we uh, go towards the end of uh, the, the interview and the show today, I'm going to ask you this question. And uh, I just want you to give your best answer possible on your, on your, on your opinion about it. Coach, what do you think about leadership do you think leaders are born or they are made and what is an example of a typical leader to you yeah so i love and i hate this question all at the same time because i believe it's both i believe that you do have natural born leaders but i also believe that you can make a leader but you have to want to be made into a leader to become a leader the problem is Everybody wants to be a leader, right? Everybody, we, we mentioned this to kids at every youth level that I've ever been involved in. Oh, we need you to step up, take action, be a leader. The problem is you need some people to be followers. You can't have 25 team captains. That's great in mind. We have 25 team captains, but you need some people to follow. That was our issue this past season where we had – I believe 23 of our 25 players on the team last year were a captain at some point in their high school career. They came in, they thought we're doing it my way. No, you can't. We, we have 25 guys. You're not all from the same system. We're all can't do it my way. We're doing it my way. Okay. So now we have to kind of get everybody on board with what I want, which what I want is usually kind of the mirror of what the team wants. So, yes, I believe leaders are born. I believe you can be a natural born leader, but I think through desire and education, anyone can become a leader. But being a leader is not just stepping up and saying, I'll do this. Being a leader is taking responsibility for those around you sometimes in good situations, sometimes in bad situations, especially in bad situations, and kind of taking responsibility for everything going on. If you have a player, for example, who comes in and they want to lead, I ask every year, I have the team do a vote of who they think should be captain. Um, this past year, I had multiple guys vote for themselves. That was the First that I've ever had that, which might be a shock that this is it took this long to do it, but I had multiple guys vote for themselves as a, as a team captain. The only vote those individuals that voted for themselves got for them was themselves. If you are only worried about your public image, you're not a leader. You're not a leader. You need to view what the collective bunch needs and what's what's best for everybody, not just what's best for you. So I think to me that's that's the biggest role a leader plays is 
that's a that's a very detailed uh, answer thank you very much for sharing that and and I, and, and I, i'm going to quickly add to that uh, one of one of my observation is and hearing it from your own perspective as a coach that deals with young men with a lot of ego uh, actually give a different perspective of the whole thing uh, i mean imagine somebody voting for himself to want to be a leader that's that's not a good example what many of them refuse to know or do not understand is uh, being a leader is not something that you choose by yourself. People can see the trait of leadership in you. But the summary of it for me, that I, I'm, for something that's always dri driving me, that's why I call myself student of leadership because I believe I'm learning every day. I, I, I don't see myself as a leader. I don't call myself one. I just believe I'm a student of leadership. It's as, a, as a leader or as a potential leader, the number one trait you must have is to be a follower. If you don't follow, if you have never followed, if you don't want to follow anybody, there is no way you're going to be a leader. And, and this is just my own uh, summary of, of what it means to be a leader. Uh, secondly, Coach, and this might be my final question, as, so I can let you go because I know you have a big schedule. Because you are a father, you are a husband, you are a leader in your own capacity, I mean, as, level, as high as you are now with, with, with your job, what do you think? makes a man what do you think makes a good man yeah i think being willing to to take on challenges to better the life of those that you're responsible for um you mentioned earlier the the soccer convention and i attended a psychology meeting briefing um as the very first session i had gone to and in it they challenged us with the question of when you wake up in the morning, is there anything you have to do? And think about that. Is there anything in life that you are required to do? The answer is no. There's nothing that you are required to do. You wake up. You don't have to take care of your wife. You don't have to take care of your children. You don't have to take care of the bills. You don't have to go to work. Those are all made by choice. And the choices are made that way because you view that you have responsibility. You are now responsible. You are now responsible for somebody else's betterment in life. So I I feel like that kind of summed up in my mind what it does mean to be a man because you do face a lot of different challenges throughout life. You have times where, you know, for example, I, I got unemployed in the middle of October from my full time my full time job. Um, still searching for a full-time job outside of coaching. But a lot of that now has led to me finding alternative ways and alternative um, ideas to try and, like I mentioned, put together a business plan, try to build something bigger and better for my family. Um, and it's all about taking risks and kind of calculated risks. You know, you don't want to just jump in without any knowledge. You want to do some research. I read a lot. Um, Sometimes it's leadership books. Sometimes it's, you know, soccer slash football related. Um, sometimes it's, I really like Stephen King. I'll read, a, I'll read a Stephen King novel and try to scare myself a little bit into, you know, this, his fairy tale mindset with some things. But um, I believe that helps make you become better because it's helping you think outside of the box. And everything comes, comes full circle with that. You know, you, you want to be the best, but... To be a man, being the best version of yourself means that you're also being the best version for other people and making sure that they're being taken care of. Absolutely. Wow. Thank you very much for uh, sharing that and for coming on the podcast. Uh, it's It's been a very, very uh, interesting experience learning from you, uh, learning from your experience, and for you to be vulnerable to share even some of the deeper part of you. And, and that is what this podcast is all about for men to come out here and be able to let people know that we are not made of steel uh that we are actually human and that we have we are vulnerable we, we, we can be vulnerable we can be weak at times and um, but more importantly like you mentioned about the choices that we make are the things that are going to shape us uh so thank you very much coach dustin wise for coming on uh crossing bridges today and definitely i look forward to have you uh on the podcast sometimes in the future again uh, is there any final note from you before we before you go yeah no i appreciate it i'm i'm willing to jump on anytime you need me so thank you very much for the opportunity
Thank you very much for coming. And uh, guys, that's going to be the show for today. Uh, Crossing Bridges with Bayonle Arashi. Uh, we've had the pleasure of talking with uh, Coach Dustin Wise, the head men's and women's coach, uh, soccer coach of Allegheny College in Maryland uh, on the podcast today. Uh, thought, question, suggestion is always welcome. And of course, I'll see you guys again uh, next time, God willing. Uh, it's been my pleasure bringing the show to you. Have a great day and uh, God bless you all. Thank you for listening to the Crossing Bridges podcast with Bayonle Arashi. Your comments, suggestions, and ideas are welcome. Follow Bayonle on all social media platforms at Bayonle Arashi or visit www.bayonlearashi.com for coaching and speaking engagements. See you next time.